1122, how are you? Hey, they're good over here. Student section, Collide 2013, what's up? Come on. Hey, if you missed welcome and announcements earlier, Chris uh, told you why there's so much rowdiness right here. Uh, normally, it's our student section at 9 and 11.22, and there's always a little rowdiness right here, but this weekend was Collide, and our students combined with about five, six other churches and has been at a weekend retreat in town, uh, praising Jesus and getting face-to-face, -face, hashtag now, and here we go. Are you guys still here? Are you awake? There they are. Hey, here's, here's my permission to you as a pastor. If your neighbor starts to, you know, fall asleep because you didn't sleep all weekend, holy elbow, upper rib cage, boom, right? Good, all right. Hey, guys, my name is Ryan. I am one of the pastors here. Uh, pastor Joby's on vacation, and so uh, I'm going to walk us through uh, Acts chapter 12. We are going verse by verse through the book of Acts, and we are seven months into it, and we're on chapter 12. Uh, we are flying through it, and so uh, we're in the middle of a series called Faith, Hope, and Love. Last week, we talked about faith, and that we, uh, Pastor Joby uh, kind of walked us through the text, and um, there's this, this picture of we need to believe what we believe and doubt what we doubt, and there were some prayers and some healing, and God just did some big things last week in our presence, and this week, uh, we're going to go through and talk about hope. Now, what the text does is the text is going to really talk less about what we should hope in and how we should hope and what hope looks like. And the scripture this week is really going to talk more about the enemy of hope. Like what would stand in our way of hoping in Christ, of putting our expectation and desires in him. And so we're going to talk about the enemy of hope. And I'm just going to go ahead and put it out there. The enemy of hope is pride. Like pride is the enemy of hope. Hope. So maybe it's fear. No, it's pride. And we're going to talk about why pride drives anything else, and it's the enemy. So with that being said, Acts, Acts chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 18. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in front of you, and it's our gift to you during the week. The Bible fairies will come in and replace the Bible for next week. And so take it and go. You guys ready? Acts 12? Are you all ready? Collide? Okay, good. I'm going to make sure you all are awake the whole time. Now, when the day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what happened, what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. So here's what's going on. Uh, what we talked about last week was the beginning of Acts 12, that King Herod, the Jewish king, King Herod Agrippa, that he had, um, the Jews had come to him and said, look, we got to get rid of this Jesus movement. So last week in the scripture, we saw that he killed James, one of the disciples. He, he killed him, had him, he's done, dead. Then he takes Peter, puts Peter in a jail, and uh, Peter is miraculously, uh, he jail, he's broken from jail. He gets out of jail, the angel comes, all the guards kind of, they pass out and fall asleep, and Peter just kind of walks out, right? <coughs> So the next morning, the, 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 the prison guard are in front of Herod, and they go, hey, P, uh, hey Herod, what, what had happened was, he, here's, here's what we, we, were, we were there, Peter was in shackles, and, and we were going, we we're just doing what prison guard does, and then all of a sudden, we're, we're all asleep, just knocked out, and then we wake up, and Peter is, isn't there, so really what had happened was, is Peter ain't here no more, and Herod goes, great, that's a great explanation, but Herod goes, look, search for them. Let's find them. They can't find them. So Herod goes, okay, that's great. Herod carries out a Roman law, a Roman tradition, which he didn't have to do because he was a Jewish king. But in order to kind of flex his authority and show off for his Roman friends, um, Herod takes the prison guard and gives them the punishment or the consequence that the prisoner, Peter, would have taken. So Herod kills off the guard. He executes them, and, and they're dead, Right? Then Herod takes off and leaves town and heads to Caesarea. Verse 20. Now, Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, having persuaded Blastus. That's a great name, right? What the heck was his daddy thinking, right? Look, I'm going to name him Blastus, right? That's almost a cuss word, okay? The king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country 
for food. So Herod takes off. He cannot deliver Peter to the Jews. So he dips. He gets out of, of, out of Judea and shows up in Caesarea. And when he gets there, the, these representatives from these two Phoenician city, self-governing city-states come to him. They, they uh, befriend and partner with Herod's, uh, one of his best advisors. And they come before him and say, Herod, you need to save us. We need, we need your care. We need your saving. Here's what happens. These two cities, Tyre and Sidon, all the way back to King Solomon in 1 Corinthians 5, had a trade agreement with, with Israel, with, with the Jew, Jewish people, uh, that the Galatian grain farmers would send grain to these coastal cities of Tyre and Sidon. And then those coastal cities would import lumber and import all this stuff. And there was this, this, this trade agreement well, for whatever reason, whether Herod caused it or something caused it, there was this economic war, and Herod had cut off the trade, which was literally starving out these cities. So these cities come to Herod and go, Herod, you're our salvation. You've got to save us. Our hope is in you, Herod. Verse 21. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes. He took his seat upon the throne and delivered oration to them. He gave them this big old speech. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God, not of man. So here's what happens. Um, let me just give you, any Bible nerds in the room? Anybody just want to claim it? Hey, I'm a Bible nerd. Anybody, anybody, am I alone? Oh, good. Like four of you are like, oh, yeah, all right. Just claim it, right? I'm a Bible nerd. You're, you're in good company here. I've got the microphone, so we rule right now, okay? Um, so let me just tell you, the, the book of Acts was written by a, a man named Luke. He was a doctor. Uh, and he, was, he went through, he wrote the book of Luke, he wrote the book of Acts, historically accurate and divinely inspired. That's the reason it made it into the Bible. The Holy Spirit inspired Luke to write the words he wrote that were historically accurate, that told the story of Jesus going to the cross and then the cross uh, becoming the, 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 the point at which Christianity spread through the world, right? Divinely inspired, historically accurate. At the same time, there's another guy named jo Josephus who wrote the Antiquities of History, historically accurate, just not divinely inspired. Now, if you're a Bible nerd, here's what I like to do. I like to lay the two books beside each other. I know the book of Acts is divinely inspired, and it is the Word of God. But at the same time, um, they, they're both historically accurate. And all truth is God's truth. And so I like to lay them down beside each other, and they tell the same story. Now what Josephus does, and Luke does it in one verse. He says there was an appointed day, Herod put on his robes, and there was a throne, and the people said, he's the voice of God. Well, Josephus takes it and gives us a little more detail in his account. Here's what he says. He says the appointed day was um, this festival in honor of Caesar. So there's this festival, there's this party, and the people of Caesarea uh, are going to uh, proclaim their loyalty to Caesar. Long live Caesar. So uh, Herod, who is obviously has no humility, he decides, okay, the day we're going to talk about how much we love Caesar, I'm going to stand up and give this great speech that they'll love me. And not only does he do that, but he says he puts on this robe. Now Josephus tells us that he put this robe on, and it literally had um, silver, like metal, silver plate, like sewn into the robe. And he stood up on this throne, the stage, and began in this amphitheater to give this great speech about Caesar. He's, we love Caesar. And I'm telling you, I'm going to bless these two city-states and provide for them. And let me tell you, and he just begins this speech. And as the sun comes up over the amphitheater, it catches his robe, and it literally looks like he's catching on fire. Like it looks like he is grow, glowing. In fact, the people in the audience start to go into fear and they start going, oh my, he is a God. In fact, Joseph, it says it this way in Antiquities. It says, the people said this. They started shouting, be thou merciful to us. For although we have hitherto reverenced thee only as man, yet shall we henceforth own these as superior to the mortal nature. So these people are in awe of Herod and they go, you are God. Verse 23. Immediately the angel of the Lord struck, down, struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last, but the word of God increased and multiplied. So they're going, you, Herod, you're God. And God's in heaven going, homes don't play that game. 
God don't play that game. Herod, you are not God. And here's what happens. The problem with Herod was not that he received praise. It's that he, he didn't redirect it. He, he didn't rebuke the people for putting their hope in him and say, no, 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 our hope is only in God. In fact, it was a good thing. Herod's a king. It was a good thing for a king for his people to like him. They, there was just loyalty and praise they were, these people were saying, we love you, our king. Now, this is not a bad thing. I mean, just imagine in our culture, in our context, if all the people loved our president. I mean, we're not, well, be careful. Don't, talk, don't start talking to your neighbor here, okay? This, this is where you get punched in the face, if, right? It, just calm down. So if we all loved our president, it'd be great. If even just our senators liked each other, just imagine how good of a thing that would be if Congress just got along, Right? That here in this moment, the king has the loyalty of his people. And yet he takes that good thing and he elevates it to ultimate. And he allows what God may be giving him in good, loyal followers to cloud his judgment and go, I'll take it. I'll be your God. He puts his pride first. The problem wasn't that he received the praise. He, he didn't redirect it. He owned it. He kept it. He, he internalized it, and what Herod did was create idolatry, both in his people and in himself. Now, here's the deal. The, the enemy, the enemy of hope is pride. And, and I could spend, I've got, you know, I've got an hour up here. I could spend the whole hour up here, and I could just put it on you about your pride. And we, I could come out with example after example after example after example and put it on you about your pride. And we would have a great response and we would humble ourselves and we'd repent. But there's a chance that we'd walk out these doors and by Tuesday or Wednesday, pride would sneak back in. In fact, some of you tomorrow morning when you go to the gym, pride will be whoop right there in your face, right? You're going to walk up to the mirror and you're going to grab the 55 pound even though you know you're going to be hurting. And you're going to start flexing. Oh, look at that, right? Now, here's what I like to do. If you work out with me, I will increase your pride, right? Because you'll be working out with me going, oh, he's weak. Look how strong I am. Come on, praise Jesus. Right, Hercules, Hercules, right? So here's the deal. We, we have the tendency to let pride just sneak in. So I'm not going to beat you up for the next 30 minutes. What I want to do is just maybe like almost lecture, seminar style. Some of you are like, oh, I didn't do well in college. Okay, well, there will be no test at the end. Um, just maybe in a, in a teaching format, can I just walk us through and help us develop a biblical view of pride, idolatry, and glory? Is that okay? Oh, come on. I like that. Hey, come on. All right, here we go. We got to start with a big idea. Here's the big idea. No one wakes up in the morning and says, today, I'm going to become God, right? None of you on your to-do list, go to 1122, watch the masters, go grab dinner, become God. Okay, that's not like your four things to do today. No one wakes up and says, hey, today, um, you know, I'm gonna be a deity. By the end of the day, I'm gonna have my own universe, right? If, you're, if you do say that, we have great counselors that we partner with that I can't, I can't help you. Um, I don't have that time up here, right? But every day, our pride tempts us to remove God from the throne of our heart. Our heart has one throne, it has one seat on one throne. God is the only one worthy to sit on that throne. And yet what pride does in us is it, it tempts us to take God, to sit him to the side, and replace on that throne misplaced hope. To put on that throne, every day to put on that throne to hope. Now here's what hope is. Hope is an expectation or desire for what's to come. And I'm telling you, the only one in the entire world that can handle the weight of your hope, your expectation, your desire, is God. And yet every day our pride goes, ah, we'll sit you here and we'll figure out the throne thing. So who's at risk? This one's easy. Boom. Okay, we're good. The remote was scaring me for a second. I didn't think I had it. Who's at risk? Pride is a danger to us all. You all going, what's going on there? I don't, either. I don't know either, right? Pride is a danger to us all because it puts the focus on you. Pride is a danger to us all because what it does is it turns the focus inwards. It places the focus on you. It puts the focus on what you can do, how you can deliver, and the hope, the expectation of what's to come 
rests solely on you. Now, here's the problem with that. You're not God. Right, let me say that again. You're not God. I don't care, students, I don't care what your mama tells you, right? Your mama, she, she may not say you're God, but she may treat you like you're God, and you're not. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to make the rest of your life easier to accomplish, right? If you think you're God, that's why you've got disciple group leaders, okay? So here's the deal. You're not God. In fact, um, we live in a culture, and, and it, just, it says you can do whatever you want to do. You can be whatever you want to be, and that's a lie. All my life, I've been trying to be 6'9 and black. <laughs> I'm closer to being black than 6'9. That's all I'm saying, right? You can't be what you want to be. And what your hope is going to demand of you is the ability for you to be whatever you want to be, for you to be able to sustain whatever you want to sustain. The problem with pride is it focuses on you. And here's the deal. Um, the Biblically, you are the imago Dei. It's the fundamental biblical doctrine that humanity, you and I, everybody in the room, by creation, uniquely bears the image of God. Here's what this says. In Genesis chapter 1, God created Adam, and he created him, Adam, and Eve in the image of God. You and I were created to do one thing, to be image bearers, to reflect the glory, renown, goodness, powerful, majestic, pure person of God. That's what we were created to do, to be this giant kind of, our lives are, would be a mirror, a reflection of how awesome and amazing and good he is, and that's what we were placed here to do, and that's why God is the only one who can be on the throne, because he's the one we're reflecting. What happens in pride, we turn the, the image, we turn the mirror inward. Here's the problem. You and I, because of sin, are jacked up. We're broken. We're wretched. At our core, without the redemption of Christ, we are not worth reflecting. And yet pride goes, no, 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 reflect yourself to the world. Reflect yourself to the world. And God's going, no, 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 reflect me. So what pride does is it takes off the throne of our heart, God, and it replaces it. And we begin to try to reflect whatever we've placed on the throne of our heart. C.S. Lewis says it this way, according to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all of that, all those, that whole giant bucket of stuff are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Did you, did you know that the devil once was an angel, Lucifer? He was in heaven. He was part of the worship of God. He was part of the reflection, the image bearing of God. And through pride, Lucifer became the devil. He said, hey, I think I could do this God thing. I think I could do this glory thing. And he fell from his, in the presence of God. Pride drove him to be the devil. Pride leads us leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. It's the complete anti-God. It is pride will drive us from focusing on God and will focus on ourselves. And when you focus on yourself, it is the complete opposite of focusing on God. What is pride? Pride is an unrealistic view of self that is usually derived from accomplishment, success, and ability. Pride is unrealistic view of self. Arrogance is an exaggerated view of self, right? So some of you struggle with arrogance, and I could, like, I could talk to you for like 45 minutes, and you would think it's a compliment. So I'm just going to let you be, okay? You just kind of sit where you're at and go, man, he's talking about me. God, oh, no, come on, right? I'm, you need to repent, okay? Here's the deal. Pride is an unrealistic view of self. Pride is just when you look at self, you don't see yourself in reality. If, you are, if you're still in your seat arguing with me on whether or not pride is a reality in America, can I just suggest... Go watch the first three weeks or episodes of American Idol. And you'll see unrealistic views of yourself, right? You turn on American Idol the first three weeks and like, well, hey, I'm going to sing a song from Les Miserables. That sounds difficult. It's okay. I'm going to butcher it, right? And then just three weeks worth of how unrealistic is your view of your ability. Now, I know some people think, hey, I'm being funny by pretending like I can't sing. And in reality, they're not funny, nor can they sing. They're just double dumb, okay? And so Eric Pride is just, it's a reality. It's, just, it's the fact that we have reality TV show. Everything but Duck Dynasty is driven by pride, right? <laughs> Come on. If you ain't watching Duck Dynasty, you need to repent of that too, right? Here's what happens with accomplishments, success, and ability. We take what God has made as good, and we make it ultimate. 
Here's what I mean. I'm not going to stand up here and demonize accomplishments, success, and ability, right? God, you, some of you are accomplishing things in business, and they're good. Some of you have had some success. You've got some finance. You've got some money. You, you've got some good looks. And I'm not, none of that is wrong. You've got skills and talent. Some of you are athletic and some of you are artistic. And some of you think you are. We'll talk about that later. And there's just this abilities. God's given you abilities. I, 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 I've got a lot of, it, of, of, of accomplishments, right? My wife's on the front row. She's not going to like this. But if you've seen my wife, she's gorgeous. She's beautiful. You would go, that guy's accomplished, right? She's beautiful. And I ain't got no money, right? She ain't fall in love with me because my check, I don't even have a wallet. I keep my, like, two cards in my phone because it makes me feel hip. And really, I just don't have any money to put in a wallet, so I just, it makes me feel better, right? If you saw her, you would go, that guy, that cat has some accomplishments. But here's the deal. My wife is a good blessing from my Father in heaven. But if I make my wife ultimate, if I take God out of the throne of my heart and I put my wife there, it's idolatry. If you take the money that God is blessing you with and you move God out of the throne and you put a pursuit of money there, idolatry. If you put, young ladies, young ladies in this room, if you take this image of what we say as a culture, as a magazine culture of what beauty is, and you pull God out of the throne of your heart, God, the one who knit you together in your, in your mother's room, God, the one who said you are fearfully and wonderfully made, the one who gives us our value, when you pull God out of the throne of your heart and you go running after some cultural image of beauty, you've, you're, it's idolatry. Now, did God give us money and family and accomplishment and work? Did he give us that stuff? Yes. And it's all good. He gave us sex. He didn't think you were going to get that taught this morning, right? Um, he gave us sex. And sex is good inside the confines of marriage. Put time out right there. Boom. All right, inside the confines of marriage where it belongs, sex is good. And every husband in here just said, hey, man, I like this guy right? Come on. He gave us sex, but here's what our culture does. God, remove you here. I know you created it. I know you've defined it. I know you've made it the best it can be, but we're going to put sex on the, on the throne of our heart, and we're going to run after it, and we're going to ruin everything in the path. And the problem with pride is it takes the good things that God has given us and makes them ultimate. And when things become ultimate, you no longer have room for God. Here's how, here's how it happens. Here's how pride, pride is dangerous. Pride will make you flee from your failure and your hurt before you learn your lesson. Pride will make you flee. It'll make you turn your back on and run out. In verse 18 and 19, what Herod does, Herod is unable to deliver Peter. So what does he do? He dips. He gets out of town. Now, if you remember the story of why he couldn't get Peter, it's because God rescued Peter as if to tell Herod, Herod, you're against me. I'm rescuing Peter. If you'll pause and figure out why you failed, you'll figure out that I am your enemy, and that's not good for you, Herod. Our culture tells us this. If you start to fail, if something goes wrong, you hide it, you cover it, and you move out. But the Bible says that in our weakness, Christ is strong. In fact, there are, there in the Psalms it says, be still and know that I am God. See, I serve a God who turns ashes into beauty. And what pride will do is it will not let us sit in our ashes long enough to hear the still, small voice saying, I know you're broken. I know you're desperate. I know you're in the bottom of the barrel. I know life looks bleak, but joy comes in the morning. And what we do, what pride does, it says, don't wait for the voice of God. Get out. Now, I'm not condoning you to, to live in pity and to live in just this weird depression and you point to yourself. I'm saying when you're broken, find God's voice. Find God's voice, not the quickest way out. Here's what happens with pride. It'll make you flee from failure and from hurt, and it will make you, it'll drive you to what you want to hear. Verse 20, what happens? Uh, Herod goes, I don't, I failure, didn't get Peter. I'm going to take off, and he goes to Caesarea. What happens in Caesarea? Oh, they're all telling him, you're our Savior. And Herod's going, I like the way this sounds, okay? Here, here's the deal. If you need a new car, or you think, maybe I need a new car, don't go to a car salesman to ask him, do you think I need a new car? Right? 
My sister-in-law, uh, she, she recently, she's got a car, and, and you know, they, they, it's like a 2012, and it's already got one part that Ford realized they forgot to put in it. And so they said, hey, bring it back. We'll get it fixed for you. They're fixing it for her. And as they're fixing her, their, her car, you know, the warranty thing, they're trying to sell her a 2013. Here's what pride will do. Pride will drive you to a place where you will find someone who will tickle your ears. And they will tell you what you want to hear. The Bible says seek wise counsel. That means if you want to know what you should do with your marriage, you seek out someone who's been in a healthy marriage for a long time. If you're trying to figure out what to do in business, don't go ask someone that's the same age as you with the same experience. Go ask someone who's got better experience, who may tell you no. The problem with pride is that when we want to hear what we want to hear, pride, because it's this unrealistic view of ourselves and unrealistic view of what we can do, we don't want to hear no. We don't want to hear no. So pride will drive you from the, from, the, from the brokenness, from the place where God may be speaking loudest, and it'll drive you to really what the Bible calls fools, people who would give you advice that does not have biblical roots. Third thing it is, is, is when you get into that pattern, pride will lure you to believe the lies. It'll lure you to believe the lies. In, in the text, Herod shows up, and they begin to tell him he's God. And Herod goes, well, maybe I am. Maybe there's enough people telling me what I want to hear, and maybe what they're telling me is true. Here's the lies. Number one, if you, be, you will begin to buy this lie that you deserve fill in the blank. That you deserve, I call it entitlement. And let me just be honest with you in two, in two ways. Now, in a culture of America, we wrestle with entitlement, and we don't even see it most of the time, Right? If I get home and my wife's got the air conditioner up to like 76, I, I'm angry. I deserve a house that's at 72. I, it's, I'm entitled to it, right? We, we begin to feel as if we are entitled to things. We're entitled that our investment in the stock market would do what we, have in, we deserve it to do. If you're under 30, let me just, just bear catch it. Just wave at me real quick. Okay, some of you don't want to claim this. Can I just tell you, if you're under 30, can, just for a moment, you don't deserve what your mommy and daddy's got, right? Right? Come on, right over here. Y'all just, y'all clap for me. Just, just y'all do it. I love teenagers. They'll do whatever you tell them. They don't know that they're clapping, that they're about to get a verbal butt whooping. Here's the deal. Um, you don't deserve, we, 30 and younger, and you, there's this sense of entitlement that when, we, when you're supposed to graduate college, you're supposed to get a full-time job, a nicer car than your mom and dad, a bigger house than your mom and dad. You're supposed to have family. Kids are supposed to be easy. And let me just tell you that when we have this sense of entitlement that I deserve and you don't deserve, you know what the Bible says we deserve? The wages of sin is death. I don't care if you're like my eight-week-old baby or if you're like 80-something in here, and God bless you, we're glad you're here. The Bible says that apart from Christ, we don't deserve anything. We deserve death. Pride will begin to give you this unrealistic view that says, I deserve. I deserve. Second thing is this. You're to credit for the good in your life. When pride starts to root in, you begin to think, well, everything good in my life, because of me. My, my role here at the church um, uh, I get to teach when Pastor Joey's out, but my primary day-to-day -day job is what we call strategic alignment, which is like this really fun way to say um, all the systems and processes and, and how we uh, are able to disciple people and, and get them moved in and take care of kids and be, all those processes that just have to happen to run a church this size, I, I get to be an active voice in planning those, right? So if, there's a dry, if someone's on a dry erase board at church, I can smell it. Like, and I go running. Like I keep, I keep like dry erase markers on me because at any moment we may need to draw a system on the board. Okay, so as we moved in here, I got the opportunity to. We were building this brand new church. Going, hey, where, where should park? How should we park in the parking lot? And where should we put serve staff? And how many, uh, how many security people should we have where? And and all the different systems. When we get hundreds and hundreds of prayer cards, what's the system to make sure our whole staff can pray for those? And and, and even like the way we check in kids. Right? Right? We check in kids, and you get this like security tag, which for some of you who don't have kids, you're thinking, good, I, what is that? Well, the numbers we put on the screen here, like sometimes like three digits, like LX4, right? We put that on there sometimes. And you're thinking, I don't know that song. It's not a song, 
Um, it's a security number, right? And when the security number comes up, it tells our parents, your kid is, is either um, in distress or causing great distress, and, and we need your help. Now, some of you, you look at, you say, LX4, LX4. Heck, they can have them for another hour, right? <laughs> go get, look, if your number comes up, go get your kid, right? So all of those systems, I was integral in building. Either I built them or I led a team that built them or I just, right, that's what I do. I love it. Two weekends ago was Easter. We had over 5,000 people here. Over 60 people gave their life to Jesus. Come on. Come on. God did some stuff in this, in this, on this campus. It was amazing. And you know what? Everything ran smooth. And you know what? On the way home, Pastor Ryan was driving going, well, of course God did that. He's got me on the team. I'm batting clean up for Jesus. I mean, like, what's going, right? And there is just something in my life. When things go good, I want all the credit. Now, the implication there is, is when things go bad, you take the guilt and the blame. And here's the deal. In the good and in the bad, Jesus is going, it's all me. It's my fault that everything is good, and I am in control when things are bad. And yet, in the lying game, in this this pride, it'll lead us to go, things are going good because of me. When things go bad... Pride goes, it's never your fault, ever, right? It's just the blame game, right? How many of you have struggling with grades and it's not your fault, it's the teacher's fault, right? There you go, just own it, just own it. The teacher hates you. The teacher doesn't hate you. If the teacher hated you, they'd give you an A and get you out, right? If they hate you, there's no reason to keep you around, right? I do counseling with, with, um, with, with adults who go, hey, my ex is my, it's the problem, my parents, they're the problem. My, you fill in the blank. My boss is the problem. My work is the problem. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, sometimes you're the problem. And if you have this reoccurring pattern of something going wrong and there being, there needing to be another person to blame each time, eventually you've got to see in that coldest stack of stupidity, you're the only one left. And you're to blame. Pride goes, no, it's not you. Last thing is this, the world revolves around you, a.k.a. you should complain. When you complain, in essence, what you're doing is saying, the whole world revolves around me. It's egocentric. The whole world, I'm the center of the world. And when the world doesn't give me what I want and what I deserve, I need to go time out. The world must have tilted out of orbit because I'm not getting my needs met. Let's time out. Everybody stop collaborate and listen. Everybody stop and let's help me get my world back in rotation and then we can move on. Pride has this egocentric lie that says the world revolves around you. And if you believe that, you've already bought into the lies. Here's how, here's what it looks like. You begin to say, I deserve, you're entitled. When no one else applauds you, applauds you, you create in every conversation the reason why people should be impressed by you, right? Here's what this one looks like, your, your credit for the good in your life. Hey, how are you doing? I'm busy. Everybody's busy, right? Just by saying, hey, I'm busy, doesn't make anybody go, oh, wow, you have crowded your schedule. Wow. You, Jesus must wait on your phone calls, right? No, right? It's just the world it doesn't revolve around you. Here's the problem with these lies. Pride, in essence, will lead you to a place where you put an idol on the throne of your heart. You put an idol. Here's what an idol is. An idol is anything. And by anything, I mean anything. Anything. Anything more important. I'm not talking about like just weird like old statues like back from first century. I'm talking about just anything, anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and your imagination more than God, anything you seek to give you what only God can give. Timothy Keller said that in a book called Counterfeit Gods, which I would encourage you to, to go buy, get it off Amazon. It, it takes this content into an even, even deeper uh, study, but anything that you put in front of God, right? Here's the truth. God is the only thing that can come through for your hopes and expectations. He's the only one worthy of your hope. He's the only one strong enough and powerful enough to take your hope and deliver on it. And an idol is anytime when we put him to the side and we begin to put our hope in things beside God. Now, I'm going to tell you almost 100% of the time, the things we put our hope in are not weird demonic things. They are 
good things that we've made ultimate. Very rarely in today's culture are we still worshiping cement statues. But we still worship beauty and fertility and wealth and success. Romans chapter 1 says this way. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give him thanks. But they, but they became futile in their thinking and foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Which we go, that's silly. I ain't nobody going to worship a lizard, right? Creeping things, that's silly. But it goes on, it says, Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Verse 25, it gets real for us. And because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Because the truth of God, that what we deserve is death, but he gives us life. That we are not the center of the world, which the lie says, but he is the center of the world. That we at times are to blame. Now, there are times when we are just part of, the, of just broken earth, broken world. But he deserves the credit and the good and the bad. And there's these lies that we begin to exchange. That if I could only get enough money, if I could only get enough success, if I could only get enough sex, if I could only get enough uh, family values, if I could only get, 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 and God's going, you're exchanging lies for truth. They worshiped and served the, create, the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Here's the problem with pride. It leads you to worship creation and neglect the creator. And ultimately, idols cannot support the hope that they demand. Verse 23, as Herod takes on this, 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 this glory that's been given to him, as he begins to swell up in his success and his pride and arrogance and success becomes more important than the God who deserves the glory it cannot sustain him. Here's, here's the thing. Created things cannot replace the creator. They can't. Why? Because created things were made under the power of the creator. The creator, God, is the one with the power to sustain our hopes. The things he created were good, and they're good for us. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, and yet we, as we in our, our, our wretchedness and our depravity, want to take these good things and make them ultimate. We want to take these good gifts of God and replace the giver with the gift. Here's, here's the truth, though. When good becomes ultimate, despair and bitterness is on its way. Here's what I mean. Um, some of you are very successful in your a little niche of business. Like in your world, in your company, you're always on the front, you're always leading, your boss is always impressed with you. And if you make that, if it's good, then it's to God be the glory that he's allowing me to do this. If it's ultimate, then it's look at this, I'm running after this, and I'm telling you there's coming a day where you're gonna reach a point where even though you're so successful, some young buck's gonna come in with a new creative way to do it, and you're gonna become the dinosaur of your industry. And bitterness and anger will set in. And instead of uh, loving and making disciples of the young buck, you are going to begin to develop an attack on why their ways won't work. If family, if your children are ultimate, your children are eventually going to disappoint you or rebel or move out, and you're going to be left in despair. I could go oh, on and on and on with each one of those little items. When you take anything that's good in this world and make it ultimate, it will lead you to a point where you're angry and bitter and in despair because the things of this world cannot. For a season, you'll think, oh, this is good, we're great, but they cannot sustain the weight of your hope. Your expectations will erode them to the point where they will dissipate and crumble and you'll be left with nothing. There's only one who can handle the weight of your hope. His name is Jesus Christ. I've got a daughter who's eight weeks old now, and a few weeks ago she got RSV, which is just like funky chest virus, and we ended up uh, in the ER, it took an ambulance ride downtown to Wolfson, spent the night on like this bed that I went, that's not big enough for my two-year-old, and yet me and my wife, somehow we, we were snuggling. It was awesome for me. I don't think she slept. Um, and so we're downtown and uh, she gets pneumonia the next week, and praise God, things are healthy, and we are healthy now. 
right? But we were talking to our pediatrician, and my wife was, and our pediatrician, pediatri- who's awesome, she's also a deacon here, uh, she said, hey, Blair, I, 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 was very, I was very careful in how I told you and Ryan information, because she goes, husbands and fathers will typically do one or two things. Um, they'll either love their wife and serve their wife and support their wife, or they, they'll, be, they'll get angry and just go crazy. And you know the reason why? It's because some husbands have put control on the throne of their heart. And when they lose control, they, they don't know what to do. Our doctor said, I've seen them kick stuff over in, in hospital rooms. Like just kicking stuff over. Why? Because they put this idol of I'm in control, and it crumbles under the weight of life. It crumbles. All right, I love you too much to leave you here, so let's start walking through this. How do we overcome pride? Pride is dangerous. How do we overcome it? First of all, you repent. Here's what repentance means. It means you're heading in one direction, you stop, and you head in the other, okay? If you were going to try to get to Miami, you're going 95 north, eventually you've got to go. I don't think I'm going to get there going this way, right? Some of you, you're so good in directions, it's in Canada when they ask for, the, uh, for your passport. You're like, I didn't know I needed a passport for Miami, which you, you might soon. Um, and so, oh, hey, we're going to flip it around, and eventually you have to repent. You're going on one way, you have to stop and turn around. Here's what we have to do. We have to identify our idol and turn from it. Here's what uh, Archbishop William Temple says. He says, your religion is what you do with your solitude. In other words, what he says, when your distractions disappear, where's your heart? When your distractions disappear, uh, here's how you begin to identify your idol. What do you daydream about? When your soul gets quiet, What stirs your soul? What occupies your thoughts? What drives your daydreams? I'm going to tell you, my my, my thought, my my area where my thoughts get quiet is in the shower. Right? I've got two kids under two right now, and so like it's the only it's the place of solitude, right? And so I get in there. I had to get out the other day and apologize to my wife. There's no hot water for you. I was in the shower too long, but don't worry, I have a staffing strategy for the church for the next five years. To which my wife was like, well, the staffing strategy better include hot water or you may not make it five years. Yes, ma'am, right? Here, here's my idol. I want everybody in the room to go, he's sharp. He's the smartest one in here. I can't believe at his experience and age that he's smarter than everybody in the world. It's my idol. So I have to, and it's where my daydreams go, Right? Start to follow your debit card and you will find what your idol demands of you. Start to find those moments where you no longer can control your emotions and you'll find your idol. You gotta go, there it is, and I'm turning away. It's not, enough, it's not just enough to see it. Secondly, you've gotta remove the idol from the throne of your heart. All right, you've gotta be willing not just to turn your back on the idol and walk away. You've gotta be willing to destroy the idol. All right, it's the, it's, the, it's the idea of if you're going to go on a diet, don't just take the cookies from the counter and put them in the pantry, all right? Because when you go to get that healthy snack at like 7 or 8 o'clock and you open the fridge for some broccoli, ooh, awesome, and then you open it and then there's a gallon of milk right there, that milk's going, I need to be dipped in. Go get the cookies. But you're 2%. It's all right. You've got whole milk for the baby. Oh, well, now I've got to do it, right? It's, it, you cannot. We can't. Oh. We do it all the time with our idols. We go, hey, I'm turning from you. And I'm walking away. Now, here's the deal. I'm not saying destroy your family. I'm not saying sabotage your success. I'm not saying develop a poverty theology and give every dollar away. Because what you'll do is you'll just get another idol. What I'm saying is this. Replace your hope in Jesus. Um. Repentance and rejoicing, they need to be married. Here's what that means. If I rejoice in the cross and what Christ did for me on the cross, I repent in joy, not in fear. I repent in this mindset of Christ died on the cross and validated me. From the cross, looked into eternity and said, Ryan Stone is mine. His name is mine. It's in the book of the Lamb. It is in heaven's roster. Validated me. I can repent easily now of trying to be the smartest guy in the room. It's no longer important. 
And so as we look and as we repent and as we rejoice in the cross and as we repent in Jesus over and over again, what we begin to do is not destroy our family, but we look at Jesus and we go, family's good in the peripheral. Family doesn't have, God is going to take care of my family and my success. He's going to take care of my financial freedom, but I'm going to run after him. So here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to respond. We're going to take communion together. Why? Because there's nothing better than communion to remind us that our joy belongs in Jesus. That our joy belongs in Jesus. Now the Bible tells us that we should check our hearts before we partake of communion. And so we're going to do that in a unique way uh, this morning. Uh, we're going to walk through. We're going to, we're going to place our hope in Jesus through communion. But just for a few minutes, the band's going to play a song over you. And I want you to take out from in front of you, there's this letter in, your, in, the, in the seat back in front of you. I want you to pull it out. And here's what we're going to do. You're going to have a moment to check your heart. And in checking your heart, you're going to write yourself a letter that reminds you where your joy is. It's going to remind you where your joy is to be. And as you write this letter, we're going to pass out the communion elements. You're just going to grab them and put them, in, put them to the side. But you're going to write yourself a letter. And in five months, we're going, to eat, we're going to mail you this letter. And you're going to open it. Because here's what you need to know about idols. It took you a long time to get idols where they are on the throne of your heart. You are going to have to be patient and disciplined and have endurance to remove them and replace them. So the band's going to sing, and we're just going to respond. We're going to respond by writing a letter, and then I'll come back up in a second and walk us through communion. So as the band plays, write yourself.